Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November Institute of Philanthropy workshop. Um, today, we're going to talk about getting off to a great start, best practices, and interviewing for development leaders with the fabulous Jody Miner, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. Um, first, a little bit about the Institute of Philanthropy. Our mission, which I just love, is to help nonprofits significantly increase their fundraising capacities and the, thus the impact they have in their communities and society. Um, so what that boils down to for us and for you is that our mission and my full-time job is to teach and train fundraising professionals and in fact, nonprofit professionals more about fundraising um, for free or low cost. Yes, you heard that correctly, free or low cost. In case you didn't already know, we are here to help you. Um, a little bit more about me. I'm the director of the Institute and I've been in the nonprofit sector here in Seattle for more than 20 years, mostly fundraising. A little bit scary that 20 year figure, but there you have it. I've also been teaching since I finished my graduate work um, for just about 10 years, uh, mainly fundraising and financial management. That's what I know, that's what I do. And I did a lot of work in the, especially in the arts, um, in annual campaign and capital campaigns. And I've written things, I have a couple of degrees that uh, cost me a lot of money, <laughs> never mind that. Um, I, without further ado, enough about me, let's introduce our speaker. I feel so fortunate to be able to introduce and welcome Jody to this webinar. Jody is a development professional who's worn many, many hats, um, which she'll tell you about in just a minute. And among those, which she's being too modest to tell you, is that she actually was the president of NDOA slash AFP Advancement Northwest when they made that change. Um, someone who I admire, respect, greatly and even with great affection can I just say welcome Jody and thank you for being with us. Well thank you so much Angela I'm really excited to be here today and I'm really excited to talk about interviewing and um, some of the some of the um, how to how to have a great interview and how to build a great team. So if you would um, I'm really excited you're all here today and if you would take a second um, to tell me in the chat who you are where you're from where where you're working today and why you wanted to come today I would really appreciate that and while you're while you're doing that I'll give you a little background on myself. So here's a little about me. I'm um, originally from Alaska but I've lived in Seattle since 2006. Um, I've had a great I've had the opportunity to work for some of the great institutions in our region. Um, I was seven years at UW Medicine. I was five years, five and a half years at Swedish, where I led the major gifts team. And then I was the chief campaign officer at PACE, which is sometimes called the Performing Arts Center Eastside or the Teddy Uchi Center, which was really great. Um, right now, I'm a fundraising consultant um, and a major gift coach. And then <laughs> in my uh, Oh so, uh, oh, so prolific spare time. I'm also the headmaster for the minor school for minor family school for exceptional girls. And that over there on the left is my third grader and our super messy third grade classroom. Um, my older daughter is in middle school. So she's in a cave up in upstairs from us. And we only see her when she needs a little bit of food. Um, let's see, uh, it looks like we have a really great folks, a really great set of folks here uh, from City U. There's a couple of people from City U, which I'm excited about. Um, it's such a great program, such a great institution. Um, and so somebody's looking to, and then uh, we have somebody who's, oh, that's Angela, spend, spend a lot of time interviewing as a director of development and executive director, but never really trained to do it. So she's looking to learn more. That's great. Um, and then, oh, and then somebody just had somebody come in. Okay, well, let's do a little survey um, also to help us. So if we go to the next slide, um, they're gonna kick off a survey here. So um, are you a, and this is multiple choice, um, feel free to choose all that apply to you. So are you a leader who's planning to have some, conduct some interviews soon? Are you a great candidate who's planning to inter be interviewed soon? And are you the headmaster of your own quarantine homeschool? You can do all of the above or none of the above. Thanks. Um, 
Great. Okay. So our choices, so our, our results today are we have about 64% of people who are uh, planning to do some interviews soon, which is great. 18% of you are hoping to be on the interview side of it. And we've got one other person is the headmaster of a quarantine homeschool. Um, so that's great. Um, thanks so much for sharing that with us today. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, let's talk about why interviewing is important. Um, when I was at Swedish, I had a team of up to 18 um, and I had a lot of opportunities to hire people there over the course of my five and a half years. And it was great because I was at Swedish and during you know, the major employment crisis of our time, which was the major nursing shortage that hospitals are going through here. And Swedish is part of the Providence Hospital System. And they were absolutely, they were, they were absolutely obsessed with making sure that their leaders and managers had all the skills they need to try to beat back some of the huge nurse turnovers that was happening in hospitals. And of course, as a, as a philanthropy professional, I got to go along for that. So I got, um, I think I got up to about 40 hours of training in management um, per year for over the course of five years. So I got a lot of great experience in that. And a big part of that was in interviewing because it's such an important part of the employment cycle. So everybody knows that building a great key, a great team is the key to any leader's success. I mean, it's, it's really what you're able to get done. Um, what, I, what, what Swedish and everyone else was saying throughout that process is that the traditional interview format and tr traditional interview practices disadvantage tr non-traditional candidates, right? So there's, there's always, there, for a long time, there's been sort of two different, um, different ways that people interview. One is that super structured, I have a set of written questions, I read them, you answer them, we don't have any follow-up back and forth, and then there's like a very short period of time in which the candidate gets to ask a couple of questions. That's one, that's one end of the spectrum. And then there's the super loosey-goosey other end of the spectrum where the manager just has a conversation with the candidates and you know, kind of has them walk through their resume and oh, what were you responsible here? What were you responsible for there, right? Um, so there was, there was a large degree of spectrum and what behavioral based interviewing was created was to create something in the middle. Um, they realized that, that that traditional interview, that loosey goosey one was getting people in trouble. Um, you know, it's when you get into an interview, when you get into a conversational type of interview, it's very easy to like get into a situation where you don't, you're not able to compare candidates equally, right? Because you have such different conversations with each of them. You're also much more likely to end up in conversations that you're really not technically, that you're really, really not legally allowed to be in, right? Um, you know, when you get conversational, sometimes you forget and you're like, oh, do you have children? And you can't ask that in an interview context. And they also, you know, they, it, interview, interviewing is also important, right? Because it's always important to remember that the best candidates have choices and that the interview is as much about them interviewing you as it is about you interviewing them. And so by having a structure and a clear plan and a clear um, set of criteria that you're looking for, it can often be reassuring and attractive to the right candidate. So let's go to the next slide. So behavioral based interviewing is an interviewing technique. Um, it's based on the idea that how you behaved in, or how a candidate behaved in the past is gonna predict how they're gonna behave in the future, right? So it's a structured format that's intended to be conversational and there, in, in the sense that there's a question, there's an answer, there's a sub question, there's another answer. You, you, keep, you keep diving, you keep cycling through a set of conversations until you get uh, until you get a clear answer. But it, that conversation is structured so that you get to information about a specific set of competencies. Um, Behavioral-based interviewing is also a method to ensure more effective and fair um, evaluation, right? Because you're able to then have a matrix that you can evaluate the candidates on, on a certain set of desired characteristics. But most importantly, in today's, in today's conversation, I think, um, behavioral-based interviewing is a great way to level the playing fields because you're moving away from, you're moving away from asking candidates about their credentials 
and you're and you're moving towards asking them about their capacities and and how they actually work. So it can be a great way to um, to build up the diversity of your team because you're able to pay more attention to non-traditional candidates. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into you know a specific how you do an in, in, in a behavioral based interview, let's just talk about some basic do's and don'ts for interviewing, right? So first and foremost, every team should be trying to build the most diverse team possible, right? There's so many studies about what diversity does for organizations, and you should always be trying to go for the most diverse pool of candidates possible. There are great trainings out there about diversifying the pool of your candidates, um, and I really encourage you to follow them. We don't, it's beyond the scope of us today, but I just really encourage you to try to get as many different kinds of candidates into your pool as possible. Um, I alluded to this before, but you should always know and follow the law. You cannot, you, you always want to avoid anything that looks like hiring discrimination in your interviews. So you cannot ask candidates about anything related to children, marital status, age, uh, gender identity, uh, race, religion, creed, anything that might, might be related to gender discrimination or just discrimination in general. Um, and you need to focus on their job related competencies. Um, likewise, in order to protect yourself in the organization, you need to follow a basic structure, st structure and cover the same topics with everyone so that you can't, so that you can show that you've objectively measured candidates against one another so that in case there ever is a complaint or an investigation, um, which is rare, it's very rare, but you'll be able to say, look, we have a way to objectively measure um, uh, objectively measure our candidates and we did follow the same basic structure. We were not discriminatory in our hiring practices. And then, you know, first and foremost, you always remember that you're recruiting and not just interviewing, right? There's no, there's no such thing in these, in these sessions as like the gotcha question. You're not trying to trick candidates. You're not trying to, you're not trying to like sweep people out. You're trying to have a conversation so that the best people are just as excited about joining your team as you are about them joining your team. Um, and, and I think behavioral based interviewing can be that kind of conversation for you. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. So here's how you prepare for a behavioral based interview. It, like there are a lot of elements that are the same as other interviews. It's just a little bit more structured. So the first thing you do is you take it, you take a team, you get your team of people and you outline the characteristics of the person who will be successful in this role. And I'll walk you through, and I, or I'm gonna give you an example in just a second of like characteristics that we're talking about. And they're, they're sort of soft qualities, right? Um, you wanna look for like, is the candidate, do you want a candidate who's entrepreneurial? Do you want a candidate who's creative? Do you want a candidate who's proactive, um, assertive, uh, a people person, emotionally intelligent, right? Those kind of characteristics is what you're looking for. And you want to, you want a slate of about five of them. Once you have your characteristics, you can design a set of questions that seek um, evidence that the candidate has those characteristics, right? And if you're having an interview team, right, where each candidate meets with a couple of different groups of people, you might want to design questions for each of those teams, maybe, you know, maybe relevant to the people who are in the room. Um, that way you make sure that each team is evaluating the candidates on a leave it level playing field and you're covering, you're covering all of your bases perhaps a couple times to see if you get a couple of different examples. Um, from there, once you have your set of questions, you also want to start thinking about what your follow up questions are going to be. Um, a lot of times with um, a lot of times the media conversation and the best part of your conversation comes from the follow up question. And I think this is where sometimes leaders get a little tripped up because it's it's follow, you know, having the right follow up question does require you to listen well, but that's your opportunity to dig in and really make sure that you're understanding what the candidates are saying to you. Um, so, you know, if you ask a don't, if you ask a, a candidate to describe a project, a detail oriented project that they had to complete on a tight timeline, right? And they, um, and they, give, you, they give you the rundown on that project, right? Um, 
walk through, have them, you can, they give you the rundown on the project and you notice that they're being a little bit vague on what detail oriented means. You can then, you can then go back and ask about like, okay, well, which details were most important to you in this, right? You, you can't make everything perfect. So how did you, what were your hierarchies in there? Or, or different follow-up questions like that to get a better sense of, of how the candidate is thinking. And then, you know, before you go into the interview itself, you always need to brief your team, right? To make sure that everybody knows sort of what you're looking for, all the characteristics that you're looking for, all the criteria you're gonna apply. And then of course, warn them about the basic dues of interviewing. Um, I find that where teams, interview teams get most wrapped up is in that, re like, don't forget that you're recruiting part, right? I think sometimes when folks get into a room with a group of people, they can feel like their their main job is to evaluate or eliminate candidates and they're maybe not as welcoming to some of the candidates as you might hope they want them to be and so i find it's always really important to get my team oriented around that recruiting part of their role too okay so let's do an example um can we go to the next slide please okay so and as i'm doing this um as i'm going through this Think about questions that you might ask to go after, to, to ask some of these questions. And if you can put them in the chat, then I'll read them out and, and maybe we can have a conversation about it. And if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat too. So I created this just, just off the top of my head. Um, so for a development coordinator role, so that would be sort of like an executive assistant or you know, a high level development oriented um, executive assistant. So if I was looking for this, if I was looking for that type of person, I would be looking for someone who's detail oriented, even when they're under pressure, someone who's entrepreneurial, someone who's appropriately assertive, but someone who's still flexible. So some of the questions that I would ask, and I just alluded to this question, right, is tell us about a time you were asked to complete a complicated detail oriented task in a high pressure situation, right? It's super, super general. Um, or describe a time you saw a need and designed a way to address it. Who did you involve? What challenges did you face? And how did you get people on board with your solution? And the last one is, have you ever had to keep a project moving even if members of the team were causing delays? How did you handle the situation? And what advice would you give to others in a similar situation? So you can see these, these, these questions are very broad, right? And they're intentionally very broad, very open-ended. Um, you know, I, there's there's nothing in there about when you were in graduate school, how did you learn to prioritize tasks? It, it, you're leaving it so that, you know, you're, you're looking for those capabilities and capacities. And then you're looking to see what kind of answers they give to you. Um, this, uh, this, this section, this question down here, what advice would you give to others in a similar situation? I've always found to be a really interesting um, part of the conversation. Um, I, find, I find that people always say very interesting things. Um, yeah, did anybody have any other thoughts? Other questions that they, that they would ask this development coordinator along the way? So let's maybe go to the next slide. So while you're in the interview with a candidate, right, it's always important to keep it conversational, but prioritize getting to your list of conversations, your whole list of questions, right? You want to help the, com the candidates feel comfortable. You want to help the candidates get a sense of what it's like to work with you. Um, but you do need to get to all the questions so that you have a way to evaluate people fairly. Um, we always, my mentor always had a, had, had a phrase that he, he's always said, listen hard, right? What you're always trying to do when you're, when you're talking to candidates is to listen to what they're saying and, and trying to imagine what's between what they're saying, the words of what they're saying. And the way you can get to that is by, you know, asking a lot of questions and then also trying to get to the why, why they did things. Um, I find when I'm interviewing that I find that when I'm interviewing as a candidate, right, what's most important to me is finding an organization that that matches my values and that and that approaches work in a way that that approaches work in a way that I that works for me, right? I work I personally work best in situations where 
people are very excited about what their work is, but then also have a have a good have a good weekend in there too, you know. Um, and and I very much value my family, as I showed you by putting up photos of me. <laughs> but I also very much value my work. And when I, as a candidate, that's what I'm always looking for in my in in the organizations. And as an interviewer, I try to give candidates a picture of the team that we have. Um, because you know the best the best fit is when your values and your expectations meet, and that's why you know it's I find it's really important to leave at least fifty percent of the interview time so for the candidate to ask questions, ask their own questions. Now, if you're on an interview schedule where you know the candidate has meetings for you know one hour here, one hour there, one hour there, one hour there, and you're leaving fifty percent of the time for their candidate, their questions, and they don't ask any questions, you might want to have a question or two in reserve, um, unless you're comfortable leaving them, you know, on their own. But, you know, you, you do want to leave the candidate a lot of time to ask their questions, and you can learn a lot by what they ask. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So after, after the interviews, it's, it's important to compare the candidates in a in, a, in an objective way, recognizing that everybody always still has their gut feelings, right? And still has their, their, their preferred candidate. So creating a scoring system can be an effective way to objectively compare candidates. Like I said, you, it, it, everybody has a gut feeling, right? And sometimes you'll have a candidate that's just like, that is my candidate. Um, still, even when you have that system or even when you have that candidate, running through, through a scoring system can be an effective way to just gut check your instinct. Um, so what you do is you start with your characteristic, you're in building your, um, building your evaluation tool. What you do is you start with your desired characteristics and have each team member rate the candidates on each characteristic. And then you provide a space for narrative statements and ask them why it is that they thought for that. Um, I personally always like to think carefully before gathering a group to discuss candidates in an official way. Um, number one, I, I like, I find I find it can be difficult. Like, I find it difficult to to listen to group think when it relates to candidates. Sometimes, sometimes you get much better feedback from if you talk one on one with folks after the meeting, or if you just get there if you get their evaluations in a written format um, rather than having everybody discuss. And it also just um, leaves you a lot less open to uh, legal issues if there's no group discussion. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So, you know, here's an example of an evaluation form for one, can for one characteristic. And if you were to just do this, you would do it for all five of your characteristics, right? So our development coordinator, right? We wanted them to be detail oriented, even when under pressure, entrepreneurial, appropriately assertive and flexible. So um, you would do this for each one. You would say the candidate provided uh, evidence that they are detail, detail oriented, even when they're under pre pre pressure, circle one. One strongly agree, two agree, three neutral, four, disagree, five, strongly disagree, right? Then you, and when you score them, right, the candidate with the lowest score is theoretically the best candidate. And then, but this is the second question is what makes you think they could be detail oriented even when under pressure at our organization? That's the kind of, that's where you often get your best feedback from your team. Um, and I like to ask that question for each of the desired characteristics um, to try to get a, uh, a fuller picture of the conversation that the candidates had. Every, every position and every organization, it's not a numerical thing, right? You're not gonna just, in this case, add up all the scores and choose the person with the lowest score, right? Because in certain circumstances, you may you know, really prefer someone who's detail oriented to somebody who's flexible. So each of the characteristics is going to have a different weight and each of the candidates is going to have a different set of strengths in each of these. No candidate is ever going to be the, you know, 
have the highest scores or the lowest scores related to all of your uh, all of your desired characteristics. And that's where the judgment of the hiring manager is going to come in. But at least this gives you a little bit of objective measurement. All right, can we go to the next slide, please? So we did have a couple of people um, on our call today who are getting ready to be a candidate. And I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm seeing more and more organizations using behavioral based interviews. And so it, as a candidate, it's useful to be prepared for those, right? So as you're preparing, if you're a candidate and you think that the organization is gonna be do it using a behavioral based interview technique or or just it's just a great way to help you prepare for a job. This is how you do it. You read through the job description and you underline any clues to desired characteristics. You'll see you see them all the time, right? All of those describing words in a in a job description. Underline those, see which ones pop out and see see what you think their five desired characteristics are. Then you come up with a set of questions that you think they might ask you to highlight those characteristics. Then you can go through your own experience and, and practice giving specific examples that highlight your abilities in those areas, right? If, you know, if you're going for the development coordinator position that I'm hiring, for instance, and you're, you're, you're detail oriented enough, but that's not your strength, but what you're really great at is you're, you're really great at being entrepreneurial and um, appropriately assertive, you know, you might want to you, you want to have really great solid examples that really highlight those strengths, but then also having, a, you know, some examples of how you're also detail oriented. And then, you know, don't be afraid to in when you're in the interview and they get to the, the part of the, the conversation in which they ask you for your own questions. Don't be afraid to ask your boss, your own set of behavioral based interview questions or the, the hiring manager your own set of behavioral based interviewing questions. You know, you can go through and you can think about what are the top five characteristics that are most important for you in with your in your boss relationship and most important for you in the team that you're working with. And, and you can ask, you can ask sort of, you can ask questions related to that, right? Me personally, I like, you know, when I was when I was first starting out and getting my first major gift job, my number one my, my number one top characteristic that I was looking for was leadership and ability to plan and execute on the plan. And I interviewed hard some of the bosses that I was, I might have been a little bit spunky as a 24 year old, but um, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But I, but it's something that's worked out pretty well for me um, it was being able to go to those folks and, and find bosses and find boss relationships that, you know, they had specific examples to, to show me that they have the characteristics that I was looking for. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. And so then, you know, after you've gone through the interview and you've, and you've scored your candidates, um, there's another part of the, the hiring process that I think is really underappreciated and that's the reference checks. Um, I have been in, I have seen situations where um, hiring managers don't call references. I've seen situations where hiring managers do a perfunctory job on calling references. And you can find a lot, you can find out a lot about a candidate um, in the reference check process um, that you know not only can help you get off to a great start in your onboarding process with them, but can help you help set you up, set up for success to manage them more effectively over the time. So I, I really can't, recommend highly enough treating the reference check process with care and consideration. Um, so when you're gonna call references, um, by the way, you it, it is possible, and, I, and it, it has been done to me as a candidate, to call references on more than one candidate to help you with, to help you in your deciding process and to help you in your interviewing process. That is okay. And you can, you can use that to learn a lot. You have to let the candidates know that they're calling references on multiple, you're calling references for multiple candidates and that, that that's an important part of your evaluation process. But it's totally, that's totally permitted and it's, it can be a great habit for you. 
Um, so when you when you call the door reference desk, I always make an appointment of at least 15 minutes so that we have enough time to have a good conversation and ask good questions. The first thing you want to do in a, in a reference check is to ask open-ended questions to figure out how the candidate and the reference know each other, how they've worked together, what their relationship was, and, and to get a sense of what the reference is going to be able to speak to in terms of that candidate's characteristics. Once you've established that relationship, I choose, I usually choose one or two behavioral based questions to ask the references related to my most important characteristics. Um, so, you know, with that development coordinator job, say my, the, the thing that was most important to me was detail oriented and entrepreneurial, I might ask, you know, I might ask the reference to give a couple of examples of how the candidate you know, exhibited detail oriented behaviors and entrepreneurial behaviors. And I would you know, also try to make sure I asked follow up questions of those references. But you always, you know, you always have to you know, be willing to, to accept a little fuzziness because sometimes references aren't gonna have the kind of relationship you know, the, like sometimes, you know, references are colleagues or they're not going to have worked with the candidates in those exact capacities. And so you might not be able to get all of the information you're looking for, but it'll still give you a great, um, a great set of um, information to help you make your decision. Um, there's a lot of conversation out there these days about whether or not you should you should call non-reference list references, right? So use your network to learn more about candidates. Um, be, you know, it, during your hiring process, but ones that aren't on the reference check process. I, I personally try to steer away from that. You never know how upfront a candidate is being or how confidential they're being about their search. And you never know what kind of situation they're in in their work life, like whether or not them being a candidate would, you know, somehow ruin their work relationship if for some reason they choose not to accept a job with you. So you just, you don't necessarily want to tread, tread into that. Um, and you don't necessarily, you, you want to, you, you want to make sure you're being respectful of those, of candidates privacy because that is a trust issue and you what you are number one first and foremost doing is recruiting and you want to prove that you're trustworthy so i think we have one more slide yep we do so in short um interviewing is just a really important part of getting off to a great start with candidates um and you know it like it's it's worth bearing in every training about management you know building a great team is the key to any organization's success it's just it is true, it is true. Um, you can use behavioral based interviewing to help, you know, to help you learn about how a person uh, behaves or how you to learn how about how a person behaves because how they behaved in the past is how they are most likely to behave in the future. Um, they also, behavioral based interviewing allows you to get beyond the resume um, and develop a, a better understanding of the character, the candidate's strengths and weaknesses and how they behave um, and, and, how, and how they work. Um, and then if there's one thing I also want you to remember is never shortchange a reference check. They're really important in the process. So at this point, um, you know, I'd love to have, I'd love to take any questions. Um, have a conversation. Is there anything that's not clear? Um, Jody, it's been said, and I'm not sure I believe this anymore, that once you get to an interview, their technical aspects of your resume are set, you're good to go. It comes down to chemistry. Can you comment on that or tell or talk about how it fits into this behavioral based approach? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that, that in some ways that is true, right? Um, you know, you if you're if you're in an interview and you're having a conversation, it's because they've read through your resume and they're interested enough in you as a candidate. Um, you know, I think I think in the I think in today's world, right, when we're trying to when we're slowly realizing as as a as a society that um, 
what is it? Credentials don't always indicate success. I mean, we've all met the proverbial, not that bright person who went to Harvard, right? I mean, like, and that's just a, like a, a, a some, somewhat tongue in cheek example, but, you know, we've all met people who have really great resumes, but don't necessarily have a lot of really great skills. And so, yes, in some ways, um, when you get to the interview, you're, you're, you know, the person's there because on paper, you, they, they look like somebody who was going to have the skills to get to the organization, but how they execute on how they do their work is just as important to as what work they do. Right. And so a resume is going to tell you what work a person does and how they do it is far more important, I think, than what they do, because how they do it is it's what's going to indicate what they do in the future. And that, that allows you then to have a much broader range of bring a much broader range of people in for interviews. We didn't get into this in this conversation. But um, I'm a big fan of casting a huge wide net in first round interviews. I don't bring a whole team of people into a first round of interviews, but I do believe in having a phone screening at least 30 minutes where you ask some solid behavioral based interview questions to figure out someone's capacities with everyone who meets the barest minimum, or you know, the, the, it was everyone possible in your candidate pool, so that um, so that you can try to cast that big, fat, wide net and try to get as many di like diverse backgrounds into your pool as possible. And when you do that, and if you use behavioral based interviewing techniques, you can get a sense of how people work, and then that becomes much less important to than what they did. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's super helpful. We have a question in the chat um, about how, I'll just read it out. How do you suggest teams address implicit biases? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that the first step in, I think that's a really important question, first of all. And I think it's something that um, we all need to be aware of. The first step in that, of course, is to be aware of your implicit bias um, and to, to make sure that your team and your interview team is aware of and believes in implicit bias so that at least they know that, they, I mean, if, if they're in denial of it, then you're probably not, like you, you it's gonna be hard to get, get beyond that. Um, I think at this, when, once you've done that and you've, you know, once you've, you know, you've made everyone aware you've assured yourself that everyone is aware that they have implicit biases, it's okay as a team to say, okay, here's our characteristics that we're looking for. I understand that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of culture that go into characteristics and, and outlining characteristics that you want um, from a person and you need to be aware of that too. Um, one culture's assertiveness is another culture's not, um, or one person's is another culture's aggression. Right, and you need to be aware of that too. Um, but you know, I think if you can have a conversation with the team up front, and you know, have some good diversity training in your organization, um, then you can at least make a few steps to get beyond implicit bias. Thank you for that. That's great. More questions in the crowd. So much good information. Your head's kind of just spinning. I, I know mine is. <laughs> we'll wait a, a few seconds more. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and thank you, Jody, so much for this. We've already, usually people save their accolades to the end, but we've already had more than one person say, this is so fantastic. And I agree. Um, thank you for giving us your time and expertise. Um, We've uh, audience guests, we will be sending out a PowerPoint and link to the recording of this for your uh, further use. Um, and uh, next month, please join us for a professional. This is for you fundraisers in the crowd. We're going to have Stephanie Ellis Smith, who is a professional philanthropic advisor. So she's going to take 
the philanthropist's point of view and talk to us about her work, how it applies to our work. Um, it's going to be a fascinating conversation and that will be December 9th. Of course, you'll get the email invitation to that. And I hope you'll join us. Um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in December. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here, everybody.